Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Bethany on Reformation Sunday. Today we mark the day, 504 years ago today, that Martin Luther nailed his 95 Thesis on the church door in Wittenberg. More about that later. I understand also that this evening some of you may be celebrating Halloween with children or grandchildren or neighborhood children. I didn't grow up in this country, so I've never celebrated Halloween, and I must admit it's, I still find it a little bit bizarre. But, <laughs> hey, I'm happy to celebrate any holiday that includes eating and dressing up in silly costumes. So, <laughs> after all, I grew up in England where we celebrate Guy Fawkes Day, pancake races, and rolling cheese down the side of a hill day, so who am I to judge others? <laughs> Let's go for it. Have a great time this evening. I like to know more about the rolling cheese down the hill day. <laughs> Some other time. <laughs> it is important to remember, though, that Halloween is not the ancient Celtic custom that some people try to pretend. Halloween, as we know it, was invented in the 1930s by the Association of American Candy Manufacturers, who wanted to create another sales day midway between Easter and Valentine's Day. And of course, tomorrow is the real holiday. Just as Christmas Eve is the day before Christmas, Halloween Eve is the day before All Hallows Day, which is tomorrow. Today, most people call it All Saints Day, except for Harry Potter. <laughs> All Saints Day or All Hallows Day is the day when we remember our friends and relatives who may have died recently. Many churches in Europe will hold those services tomorrow on the actual day. It's the custom in the Lutheran Church to hold it on the Sunday after. So next Sunday, we will be celebrating All Saints Day, or All Hallows Day. And we will be reading out a list of our friends here in the congregation who have died recently. And we will be celebrating their contribution to the church and to our community. So, do join us next Sunday for All Saints Day service. As we move into November, we also, of course, remember Veterans Day. And it's our custom here at Bethany around this time to hold a veterans breakfast. We offer a free breakfast to veterans and thank them for their service. This year, it will be next Saturday, November 6th at 8.30 a.m. in a tent outside. Uh, Karen, do you want to add anything about this event? It didn't pretty much help at all, but uh, it begins at 8.30 in the morning. Um, if you know any veterans or you are veterans, please uh, call the office and leave a message or send an email to Bethany from our uh, It will be a bag book, a bag breakfast like we did last year. Um, we're hoping for good weather. We're hoping that we will have the canopy tent set up in the backyard. Um, and that's it. Any questions, you know, feel free to ask myself or uh, Bill Izzard. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. It's very important that we remember the service of our veterans. Uh, where's Bill Izzard? He has some announcements also. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we had a little bit of type of activity happen the other day with four or five of us met downstairs in Gibson Hall. We found out we have the walls are very wet walls and that we've, they've been tested. So the requirement is that we don't know the whole full results at this time yet, but when you come in the building, you will not be able to use the side door. If you have a key to use the front door and go down and you're only allowed into the undercroft and part of the kitchen. And mask is required. For the, that's to help protect you if you're coming into the church on that part. Uh, so also is if anybody's available tomorrow, somewhere around 9.30, I have a few things that we have to move out of the way. It would take about maybe less than an hour. So if you can help, okay. Uh, other than that, after the church, if you have any questions, 
uh, please come to see me at the church. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, just a reminder also, uh, as you know, the Bread of Life Food Pantry is planning to provide Thanksgiving dinners for families in need. And you can donate a turkey, uh, or you can donate any side item, such as um, canned yams, stuffing, turkey gravy, canned green beans, things like that. Um, I believe that the side items have to be given this week. The food pantry will be open for donations Wednesday afternoon between 1 and 3, and Thursday evening between 7 and 8. But if you're donating a turkey, you have until the 16th of November, because they don't want lots of frozen turkeys in there with nowhere to put them too early. So if you are going shopping over the next couple of days, buy a couple of extra cans. Let's help the food pantry to feed as many people as possible this Thanksgiving. And to that, they requested specifically cans that have the pop tops, the ones that you don't need the can opener to open because they say they have a shortage of can openers in order to open like green beans and corn and stuff like that. So they would prefer ones that have the pop tops and stuffing and items like that that only require water and not milk specifically. Thank you, Emily. If you've been putting toys in the shoe boxes, next Sunday is the last week to bring them in. I remembered to put mine in today. And uh, Betty tells me they're all stacked up against the wall. Um, if any of you could stay after the service to help sort out the boxes, that would be really good to see Betty. Um, and of course, we're continuing to recycle things that don't normally get recycled. Check with Karen or check the box by the front door to see what is accepted. Let's see if we can exceed our goal by the beginning of December. We celebrate the birthday this week of Alyssa Swiger, who's not here. But <laughs> wish her happy birthday to us. That's the only birthday I was given. Nobody else has a birthday this week. Well, happy birthday, Alyssa. And congratulations to her mother on bringing up such a fine young woman. I remember when she was a tiny girl, I taught her in Sunday school. Now here she is, all grown up. And I look just the same. <laughs> yes, you if, if only, if only. Does anyone else have any more announcements? In that case, let us prepare ourselves for worship. Debbie has requested that you turn to hymn number 527. We're not going to ask you to sing, but we'd like you to look at the words of this hymn while Debbie plays it to us. The first verse reads, Lord Jesus Christ, be present now, our hearts in true devotion bow, your spirit send with light divine, and let your truth within us shine. So meditate on those words as Debbie plays for us.
confess our sins, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us now confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have, have mercy on us. In your, your compassion, forgive us our sins, now and in our name. Things done and left undone. Uphold us by your spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. To the honor and glory of your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace we have been saved. By the power of Jesus Christ our sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen us through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in our hearts through faith. Amen. My gathering name appropriately was written by Martin Luther himself. A mighty fortress is our God, number 504.
away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. Glory, Glory to God, God in the highest, and to Jesus Christ's God God people Lord. on earth. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Glory to God in the highest, and to Jesus Christ's people on earth. Let us pray. Almighty God, gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in times of trial. Defend them against all enemies of the gospel. And bestow on your church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for our Bible reading. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The first reading is from the 31st chapter of Jeremiah, beginning at the 31st verse. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. And I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of God, the word of God. Thank you. Thanks be to God. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth be moved, and though the mountains shake in the depths of the sea. Though its waters rage and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Lord God. God is in the midst of the city, it shall not be shaken. God will help it at the break of day. The nations rage and the kingdoms shake. God speaks and the earth melts away. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come now and go at the works of the Lord. What desolations God has brought up on the earth. Behold, the one who makes war to cease in all the world. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still then, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The second reading is from the third chapter of Romans, beginning at the 19th verse. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed, and it is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they are now justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by His blood, effected through faith. He did this to show His righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over the sins previously committed was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and 
that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. Word of God, word of life. Thank you, Jesus Christ. Please rise for our gospel. Fear amongst the congregation. 
They were told that sin would be punished by God. They would pay for their sins by being sent to purgatory, although they could pay for an indulgence to reduce their punishment. And these indulgences and these payments kept the church and its leaders very rich. They were kept in line by telling them that only those who did good works would get into heaven. You may remember me talking on a previous occasion about why there are so many bridges in the city of London. In medieval times, wealthy merchants thought they would go to heaven if they did something good, so before they died, they paid for another bridge to be erected so that people could get across to the market. People thought they had to buy their way into heaven. And of course, all church services were in Latin, as was the Bible. It was actually a crime if you published them in your own language. Heaven forbid people should actually understand them. The priests made sure that they were the only interpreters of the gospel. So really, all that Martin Luther was questioning was, does any of this actually reflect the teaching of Jesus? And he asked 95 questions to make sure they got the point. And I was reading a piece that said he wasn't actually trying to start a revolution. He was trying to initiate an open discussion amongst the congregation. But of course, the church leaders were affronted. They didn't want to be challenged. And they especially didn't like it when Luther, Luther quoted the scriptures at them. Weren't they the experts on the Christian faith? Who does this Martin Luther character think he is? Martin Luther's main point was, you can't buy your way into heaven. We are not saved by doing good works. We do good works because when we know Jesus, we want to do good works because it brings us joy. We are saved, he said, by grace alone. And Paul wrote about that in his letter to the Romans, which Steve has just read to us this morning. He said, the righteousness of God has been disclosed through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There is no distinction since all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God, we are justified only by His grace as a gift. In other words, there are no good guys and bad guys. We can't work our way into God's good books. We are all imperfect, fallible human beings. But by the grace of Jesus Christ, He reaches out and transforms our lives. It's nothing we can change by our behavior, or good works. Sometimes you hear people say, oh, those Christians, they think they're so good. They have that holier-than-thou attitude. Well, perhaps some branches of our faith may present that image, but actually the opposite is true. We don't think we're better. In fact, we know that we're sinners. It's part of human nature to grab what we can for ourselves. If you're a parent, you know. You don't have to teach children how to be bad. They sometimes manage to do that quite naturally. You only have to teach them to be good. Sometimes that's very hard. You may have heard of the couple who was concerned about the behavior of their two boys, Ryan and David. His wife said, you know, that new pastor is supposed to be really good with discipline and uh, he's good with children, maybe we should invite him over to talk to our two boys and teach them the error of their ways. So the pastor came over and he agreed to talk to the boys, but he said, I'll talk to them both uh, individually. So the youngest, eight-year-old Ryan, went in first. The pastor sat the boy down and asked him sternly, now where is God? The boy said nothing. So the pastor repeated his question, in an even sterner tone, I ask you, where is God? Again, the boy made no attempt to answer. So the clergyman raised his voice and shook his finger and said, where is God? The boy bolted from the room, terrified, ran upstairs and hid in the bedroom. His older brother came in and said, what happened? The younger brother said, we're in big trouble this time. God is missing and they think we did it. <laughs> struggling to make ends meet. At 
very little wages coming in. And the husband was livid when his wife came home with a $250 dress that she just bought. He said, how can you do this? You know we don't have the money. She said, it wasn't my fault. I was outside the store looking at the dress in the window, and suddenly I found myself trying it on. It was like Satan was whispering in my ear, you look fabulous in that dress, buy it. Her husband said, well, you know how I deal with that kind of temptation. I say, get thee behind me, Satan. She said, I did. But he said, it looks fabulous from back here, too. <laughs> We're all normal, fallible human beings, reliant on the grace of God alone. But what becomes of boasting? Well, again, you heard it in today's reading. Paul says, it's excluded. We have nothing to boast about, except God. As our church motto says, God's work, our hands. Robert Baden Powell once said, I believe that God put us in this jolly world to be happy and enjoy life. And I found the most worthwhile way to find happiness is by putting happiness into the lives of others. One of my favorite answers from my list of answers from children was given to me by a teacher who had been teaching her class about forces of nature, like hurricanes and tornadoes. And on the test, one of her questions asked, what is the most powerful force on this planet? And the little girl wrote, love. And though it wasn't the answer she was looking for, the teacher was so moved that she shared it with all her friends. And she quoted Jesus when he said, out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have perfected praise. Indeed, sometimes children can see straight to the truth. At the end of his ministry, Jesus said he could sum up his teaching in three words, love one another. And for those students taking notes, he added two subheadings, love your friend, love your enemy. And they said, no, Jesus, you got it wrong. It's love your friend, hate your enemy. That's why they're your enemies. And Jesus said, no, love your friends, love your enemies, because love will always triumph over hate. Hate will only produce more hate. I think Bain Powell is right. It's not about ourselves. True happiness is found in our love for others. That's why we all wear masks and get vaccinated. We know that while we may feel protected, we can still pass the virus on to others. A horrible virus that even if it doesn't kill, has left some people with long-term side effects like memory loss, lung disease, and even blindness. Why on earth would a Christian want to expose others to that? Love one another, Jesus said, as I have loved you. So I was reading this book by David Frankel, who's a psychiatrist, and he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. Obviously, women don't need to search for meaning because they already know. <laughs> You have to change that to people search for me, perhaps, in the next edition. I happened to pick it up, and I read it, and he said, the problem for Americans is that they have inscribed in their constitution the pursuit of happiness. Dr. Frankel says you can't pursue happiness, because if you pursue happiness, you'll never find it. If you pursue happiness, you're thinking of yourself. So you're likely to pursue those things that you think will bring you happiness, like a new iPhone, a new car, or a bigger house. Dr. Frankel said you can't pursue happiness. In his experience, happiness is what ensues when you are pursuing a passion or an interest outside of yourself. Or you're pursuing uh, giving happiness to others. Dr. Frankel says don't aim at happiness. The more you aim at it, the more you make it your target, the more likely you are to miss it. For happiness, cannot be pursued. It must ensue as the side effect of one's dedication to a cause greater than oneself or as a result of one bringing joy to another person other than oneself. Dr. Frankel knows something about happiness. He spent most of the Second World War in a Nazi concentration camp, not knowing 
if each day would be his last. And yet he said that even there, there was a kind of fellowship, a shared experience, even jokes and laughter among the prisoners. Even there, they had a community, and he feels that that is what uh, enabled them to survive. They had people to care for. 504 years ago today, Martin Luther wasn't afraid to ask questions. He faced anger, criticisms, and ridicule. But eventually, the Protestant church, so named because they protested against the established church, the Protestant church came into being. If you want to know more about the Reformation, I recommend this excellent video by Rick Steves, Luther and the Reformation. Rick Steves is my favorite travel writer, and he does an excellent job on this video. And since we must all confess our sins, I'm going to confess mine to you now. Lois lent me this video about two years ago, and I never gave it back to her. <laughs> I'm hoping she doesn't expect a penance from me, or uh, make me buy an indulgence. I'm hoping that, like Jesus, she believes in the forgiveness of sins. I'm going to give it back to her today. This video is one hour long, and it's certainly not boring. It's very exciting. It takes you to all the places where Martin Luther was and what actually happened in the Reformation. I did some research yesterday, and these days you can actually watch it on Amazon Prime, and you can even watch it for free on YouTube. But you have to be careful, because there's about 12 videos called Luther and the Reformation. You have to look for Luther and the Reformation by Rick Steves. And uh, it really is worth watching. In today's Gospel, we read that Jesus said, the truth will set you free. But of course, starting the Protestant church wasn't all plain sailing. They too had their differences, which is why they eventually separated into the Anglican church, the Methodist church, the Baptist, the Presbyterians, in our own Lutheran church. But what we all have in common is Luther's assertion that we are saved by grace alone, and that we are united, not by fear and threats and punishments, but by the knowledge that our sins are forgiven, and by the teaching of Jesus that we should love one another as he loved us. Amen. Now let us rise and sing an optimistic song, All Earth is Hopeful, number 266. Please rise.
Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Set free from sin and death, and nourished by the word of truth, we join in prayer for all of God's creation. We pray for all who long for a word of truth and for the radical grace that flows from the cross. Inspire congregations to freely and boldly proclaim your love for all people with persistence and hope. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for your creation, for mountains, rivers, streams, cities, homesteads, and neighborhoods. Write in our hearts a new love and care for creation. Give us the will to curb wasteful habits and to hold accountable those who neglect the vulnerable. We pray especially for the meeting next week in Scotland, where all the world's leaders are meeting together. May they be ready to listen to each other, to work together to end the climate crisis and to strengthen efforts of reconciliation among all nations, that peace may extend in every direction. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for all who aspire to public office, and for all who will vote on Tuesday in local polling places. Pour wisdom and understanding upon all who govern, so that communities of justice and peace may thrive. Hear us, O oh God. Hear Your mercy is great. great. We pray for all who long for healing in mind, body, or spirit. Strengthen the hospitals, clinics, counseling centers, nursing homes, and recovery centers to be holy spaces of renewal that all might live the abundant life you intend. We pray especially today for Town the Forest, Madeline Yowder, Jeannie Willard, Jennifer Sweeney, Phyllis Tess. We pray for Mike Wilson's mother, Janet. We pray for Paul Swagusti, the Kane family, Sandy Syndrome, Beth and Penny Flack and their family. We pray for the DeVetra family and for Morella's daughter, Linda Patton. And we pray this morning for Judy Evans. Now let us each feel free to pray, either out loud or in the silence of our own hearts, for those people known to us who need God's healing or support at this time. Hear us, O oh God. Your brother Jesus is great. We pray for all who seek to grow in faith and love of you. Guide teaching and learning in confirmation, small groups, Sunday schools, youth groups, schools, seminaries, and universities. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We give thanks for all the saints and reformers who have gone before us, who now dwell in your holy habitation. Give us courage through their example to challenge unjust systems and work towards life-giving reformation. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Confident that you hear us, O oh God, we boldly place our prayers into your hands. Through Jesus Christ, our truth and life. Amen. And now may the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us safely share.
share the peace with each other. Let us pray. O oh God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need. Awaken us to the needs of others. And at the end, bring all the world to your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Let us now say together, Prayer which Jesus Himself told us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power. Be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Our final hymn today can be found on the insert to God be the Lord. <laughs> 